If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. and welcome to our show. Today we have a special program for you. We have a debate. And the debate is between evangelical Christianity and Roman Catholicism. And as our guest today, we have Larry Wessels. Larry uh, is defending the evangelical Christianity side. It's good to have you, Larry. Thank you, Dale. It's and, good to be here. Great. And uh, Dr. Fastigi, representing Roman Catholicism. It's good to have you also, good to, Doctor. Good to be here. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, today's title is, Does Romanism Teach Another Gospel? And this is the second part of our debate. Uh, it's been, a, we had a first hour already, and this is our second hour, and I believe our concluding hour. Um, what I would just like the, to inform the viewers about is that uh, we only know truth from God and God's Word. And you must seek the scriptures to, even if your pastor's telling you something. According to Paul, he commended the Bereans for even uh, uh, searching the scriptures of what he said. So I would just, uh, there's a lot of religions and a lot of cults out there uh, adding things, saying different things. Uh, I could list down a whole bunch of different beliefs, uh, uh, denying the deity of Jesus Christ, uh, saying Jesus is the blood brother of Lucifer like the Mormons do or whatever. We have to look at the Bible. Does the Bible really teach that? So be objective and uh, enjoy this debate. Now, Larry Wessels. has a degree from the University of Texas and does uh, cult and counter-cult ministries uh, for about 12 years. And uh, he'll, like I said, he'll be defending evangelical Christianity. And we have Dr. Fastigi with a Ph.D. in historical theology from Fordham University and right now is a professor uh, of theology at St. Edwards. That's right. All right. And you will be defending Roman Catholicism. Yes. All right. With that, uh, Larry, uh, since uh, Dr. Fastigi had opening and closing statements last show, you'll have opening and closing statements this show, and you have three minutes. Okay. Well, the subject of our debate is, does Romanism, that's basically the Roman Catholic Church, does it teach another gospel by its decrees, councils, papal bulls, and what have you? And I'd like to start out with my chart here uh, behind me uh, with this scripture reference out of Galatians chapter 1 to, to stress the importance of this, this question. Here uh, we have Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And it says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ 
unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now the word accursed there in the Greek is anathema, which means to be eternally damned. You know, you're just going to have to go to hell. That's all there is to it, is what Paul's saying here. It's, it's rough, but it's true. Uh, and, and Paul had also said in places like 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37, If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him understand that the things I write unto you are the commands of God. Now, we're, we're sticking with the scripture here to get an idea of what Paul said. Not church fathers and, and other people or what some church declares about it later on. We're talking about the scripture. Okay, what I want to say here is that uh, when you go to Roman Catholic theology, you find another gospel. You find a plan of salvation that is contrary to the uh, simple faith alone in Jesus Christ, salvation by uh, Jesus, and, and uh, faith alone by grace alone. And uh, to back me up on this, uh, as far as a, a difference, of course, you can go to Romans chapter 5, verse 1, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through uh, 10, and so forth. But uh, with one minute to go, let me quote a, uh, a fairly famous Roman Catholic theologian who would back me up on the assertion that they teach another gospel. I'm going to quote Carl Adam. He wrote The Spirit of Catholicism from Macmillan Publishing Company, 1928. And on page 2, he says... We Catholics acknowledge readily, without any shame, nay, with pride, that Catholicism cannot be identified simply and wholly with primitive Christianity, nor even with the gospel of Christ, in the same way that the great oak cannot be identified with a tiny acorn. There is no mechanical identity, but an organic identity. And we go further and say that thousands of years hence, Catholicism will probably be even richer, more luxuriant, more manifold in dogma, morals, law, and worship than a Catholicism of the present day. A religious historian of the 5th millennium A.D. will without difficulty discover in Catholicism con conceptions and forms and practices which will derive from India, China, and Japan. So he's saying that there's no uh, real relationship. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, Time's up. Okay. <laughs> Time's up. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fastigi, three minutes. Well, I, I appreciate this time, and uh, it's a rather large claim to say that Roman Catholicism or Catholicism has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think that has to be established, and nothing you said really has established that. The quote of Adam or Adam uh, is simply saying that there's growth within the church and growth in terms of the understanding of the mystery of Christ. Of course, Adam is a private theologian. He doesn't represent official or solemn Catholic teaching. So we have to uh, put that in mind. But there is certainly a growth in terms of the understanding of the mystery. I mean, after all, it took a while to develop the terminology of the Trinity. That wasn't until the 4th and 5th centuries A.D. But today, we, uh, I would hope you would believe in the Trinity. But they had to come up with a, under, a, a term to explain what Scripture has revealed about the nature of God being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So those names are there. But it took a, a, a while for the early church to develop the theology of the Trinity. So no one's, uh, I don't think you would deny that there is growth. What I would like to point out is that Protestantism is disconnected with the New Testament. The New Testament tells us that Jesus gave his body and blood as true food and true drink. But although some Protestants believe in the real presence, uh, I believe that you do not. In fact, the last debate you said it is a blasphemy and idolatry. Well, the church fathers uh, certainly believed in that. So you, you, you were wondering, what gospel are you teaching? You said faith alone. Uh, we'd have to look at scripture itself and see, does, is faith alone taught? The only time the phrase faith alone appears is to reject it in James 2.24. We are saved by grace. The Catholic Church acknowledges that. But works certainly are important because our Lord in Matthew 25, when he's talking about who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, he says nothing about faith. He's talking totally about works. So here we have a problem. We have some parts of Paul seeming to indicate that faith is the foundation. But Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 13, 2, if I have faith great enough to move mountains, that must be a very great faith, but have not love, I am nothing. So Paul does not teach faith alone. 
James 2.24 is a corrective against that. Matthew 25 is a corrective against that. Nor does the Bible teach Scripture alone. So if these are the two uh, primary dogmas of evangelical Christianity, as you would identify yourself, then you are disconnected from the New Testament witness. You are disconnected from the apostolic church, and you have a lot to establish to try to say we are teaching another gospel. We are teaching the gospel of Paul as it, it, taking into account all of Paul, but you are cutting Paul apart and being selective, taking some parts of Paul and ignoring others. Okay, time's up. Thank you, Dr. Fastigi. All right, again, we are having a debate with evangelical Christianity and Roman Catholicism. And with that, we're going to just open it up, an open debate on the subject. And um, Larry, go ahead and start. Okay, I'd like to start. Uh, Dr. Fastigi is correct, uh, very correct when he said I'm disconnected. I'm disconnected from the gospel that his church preaches. And I want to show a little part of this gospel that I don't think Paul ever stated. Look here on the chart. And we, I tried to get to this last hour, but we never seemed to get to it. But it's called the doctrine of, and I'll mispronounce it, but Dr. Mori, I mean, <laughs> Dr. Prestige knows how to pronounce it better than I do, supererogation. And uh, as defined by Bishop Fulton J. Sheen in his book, Peace of Soul, page 208, he says, through them, the saints, Mary, etc., the church gives her penitence a fresh start, and the church has a tremendous spiritual capital gained through centuries of penance, persecution, and martyrdom. Many of her children prayed, suffered, and merited more than they needed for their own individual salvation. So here's some people that merited and suffered and all that more than they needed for their own individual salvation. So what happens? The church took these super, -er, ab super abundant merits and put them into the spiritual treasury out of which penitent sinners can draw them in times of spiritual depression. So here's some people who've done super abundant works. They've done more good works than they really need in order to attain their salvation. And so here's, here's a guy named Joe, and he's got uh, two tons of good works. And God says, well, man, you, you only need a th uh, one ton to, to get out of purgatory. You only need 500 uh, pounds to get out of, uh, you know, to, to make it to heaven. So you've got these extra 500 pounds left here. Why don't you... Uh, uh, well, these are extra works. Well, let me put them in the treasury of the church, and, and then the church can dispense them out to who they want. In fact, Vatican II even backs that up. Mm -hmm. As you're well aware, I think, uh, Dr. Prestige, you know that Vatican II talks about the spiritual treasury of the church, sure. and uh, this is uh, predicated on the, uh, uh, the, the vicar of Christ who is built on the rock, the Peter, the first pope, and that the, the church then dispenses out, sort of like a spigot, you're at a bar, and a, you know, and, and, and you've got the different soda pops or whatever, or beer or whatever, and you can you pull a spigot, and, and it'll let out some of it. And this is the, what I'm talking about. The Roman Catholic Church teaches a different gospel in that they take the grace of God, and they dispense it out through these spigots. It's like I say to my wife, here, I want to give you a million dollars, but I'm going to give it to my brother, who will then give it to you. But my brother says, hmm, I'm going to put this million dollars in my bank, and then if I get his wife to do a lot of good works and I'll give her a little of it at a, at a time. Well, that's exactly what Roman Catholicism is doing. It makes all these works through praying to the dead, to uh, penance, uh, you know, through the confessions, absolution of sin, and, and all, those, all those other kind of things. I, I know you're dying to talk, so go ahead. I don't want to talk right, everything. Do, finish your point, though. I don't want okay. to interrupt like Basically, that. Basically, uh, as I'm saying, the Roman Catholic Church teaches this gospel of superior, uh, you know, like we've mentioned in the previous show about condign merits, and uh, congruous merits, which according to the church, uh, the condign merits are such great works. In fact, uh, I have a, 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 a thing here. It's called Meritum de Contigmo, or otherwise uh, condign merit, which says merit that is so meritorious that it implies intrinsically an obligation upon God to reward it. Mm -hmm. That is a work that is done that justice demands that God reward that work done by whatever saint or whoever else. And then, of course, the other one is uh, 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 Meritum de Coruio, uh, congruous merit, which is merit of a lesser order, merit that is faulty and fragile, mixed with human imperfection and weakness, so that it doesn't impose an obligation on God to reward it, but it, it, it nevertheless... It, it, it is nevertheless of sufficient value that it is fitting or congruous for God to reward it. Of course, this is one of the big battles 
that took place between the, in the, during the Protestant Reformation over these kinds of works tied in with the supererogation and, and the condign merit, the works versus free grace of God. Sola gratia. Sola gratia. Well, yeah. this is the Catholic Church does teach we are saved by grace alone. The question is whether or not uh, our good works, our good actions, biblically speaking, uh, can be applied in a secondary sense to help in the mystical body of Christ, which is his church. This is the question we're dealing with. You see, uh, the Catholic Church believes very strongly in the church as the body of Christ. Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 says that as one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. If one part of the body is honored, the whole body is honored. So this is the idea that there's an interconnection between the members of the mystical body of Christ. So there's a spiritual interconnection. And the, in, the prayers of intercession, which are biblically grounded, Paul asks for prayers of intercession. He even prays of for... Of living people? Yeah. Well... They're, not they're, dead people. Yeah, but there's no dead in Jesus Christ. God is the God of the living, not of the dead, as Mark 8 well, tells the, us. The Bible but, says Moses is dead. Let, let, let's get back to the question. Uh, when we speak of supererogation, uh, it's a biblically founded under, uh, a word. It uh, comes from the Vulgate edition uh, of the Gospel of Luke, uh, the Vulgate being the Latin translation of St. Jerome, Luke 10, 35, where the Good Samaritan tells the innkeeper, whatever thou dost spend besides. So the word erogare means to pay out or to expend. So it's doing more than what is required. Even Jesus said, uh, go the extra mile. So in other words, this is the, the, the saints who have spilled their blood, the saints who have done incredible works of charity. Now the question we have to raise though is this, D does the Catholic Church teach that those uh, great works of, uh, of charity of the saints merit sanctifying grace. That is the grace by, uh, which enables us to be saved or to be justified and to, to be sanctified. And no, the Catholic Church does not teach that it merits that type of grace. But it is biblically grounded, number one, that we can link our sufferings and good works to the merits of Christ in the mystical body. This is biblically grounded, and it is also biblically grounded that God promises rewards appropriate to our good works. But not and for so, salvation. Uh, not for salvation, but in other words, they contribute to sanctification. I think that maybe would be a good distinction. Okay, if Let, I... let's, let's get to the scriptures. First, Colossians 1.24, if you have it. Okay. Paul says, writing to the Colossians, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, which is the church, of which I am a minister in accordance with God's stewardship given to me to bring to completion for you the word of God, the mystery hidden from ages and from generations past. So what is Paul doing here? Now, filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ? Obviously, then, he's talking now about another way in which we participate in the work of salvation, not meriting the sanctifying grace or the grace of justification, but participating as members of Christ's mystical body in terms of the ongoing work of sanctification. Okay, and so, and so uh, Paul clearly indicates that in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we are God's co-workers. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, we are ambassadors of Christ as if God were appealing through us. So God works through us, and although, although Christ's merits are absolutely super abundant, since Paul tells us in Ephesians to be imitators of Christ, since Jesus Christ himself says that we must take up our cross and follow in his footsteps, he's now under his own will allowing us to share our sufferings and good works and adjoin them to his sufferings to create that sense of solidarity. For salvation. Now, for, it contributes to salvation it in this sense. It contributes to salvation. It, yes, but it is not the foundation. The foundation, the meritorious cause, as I read to you before, of our justification 
is the death of Jesus on the cross. This is taught clearly in Trent and has never been denied. Now, are you saying the Bible does not indicate that there is a reward for good actions? There's the believer's rewards at the Bema Seat, as you'll get in, I think, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. But I deny, I, I believe those verses you just read, but I deny your interpretation wow. of them. And I also say that Trent, or actually it's Vatican II, volume 1, page 70, does say that these superabundant works that I've read here from the, the chart on super irrigation is for salvation. Uh, unlike what you just told me a minute ago. I tried to clarify that. It's not the foundation. Okay, let me read it then for you. It says, uh, talking about the treasury of the church. What, what is this, Larry? This is Vatican II, volume 1, page 70. Well, what is You've the... got it on tape, so you'll know where to look. All right, but I don't know which volume you're talking about. You have to go to the particular document. That, that's easy, but next time okay. you'll know that. Okay, well, anyway, you'll, it's in there. It says, it's in, it says, entrusted to blessed Peter and his successors who are Christ's vicars on earth, so that they, in other words, it's talking about the treasury of the church, That's you right. know, right before this, uh, they've been entrusted with and the successors who are Christ's vicars on earth, so that they may distribute it, the treasury of the church, to the faithful, that's the spigots I was talking about, for their salvation. Yeah, for, the good for their salvation. Yeah, but you can't take that word out of context. In other words, for their salvation in the same sense as those other scriptures I read to you before, where James says that the prayers uh, of, of church members can help to save people. So it's, now, not, it's not talking about the foundation, but in other words, it contributes to their salvation. You have to read it all now, in context. Now, you read from now, here Colossians 1, 24, I think you, you said. That's right. You read this verse. He said, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, yeah. which is the church. Now, on the radio debate we had last week, you stated that in, a, in, a, in an extended sense, the body of Christ and the church is everyone that's been created by God. So he's in talking here about the worshipers sense. of Athena or any other pagan religion. Well, and, as, as God, God can do whatever he wishes. So these superabundant works can be transferred from, let's say, some uh, like Mother Teresa. Well, we can take her example. Yeah. She's probably got more than enough, I would, uh, I would assume you would agree with. Yeah. And then those could be transferred to maybe some Hindu monk that needs them so he can attain his salvation according to Vatican II, volume 1, page 70. Well, if it, it, does, it wouldn't hurt to pray for someone, to pray that God's mercy be, be given to someone. What's wrong with that? Now, now, now well, here's uh, the What's thing, because we're debating on is this the true gospel, I, and we brought it up in other debates, but to me, and I know you're fascinated with too, and I, I want to bring it up on my chart here about who speaks for Rome and then have your comments on this, because I don't think you've okay. uh, been exposed well, well, to Well, Larry, this. before we switch, let me just read to you a few scriptures that indicate that there is uh, uh, merit for what we do. St. Well, Paul, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, As you sow, so also shall you reap. And those who sow sparingly shall reap sparingly. Not for salvation. No. Uh, then Romans 2, 6 through 8, God will repay everyone according to his works. Eternal life to those whose work proves to be a good work. I'd have to look it up, but I just, that's the main point I wanted to get across. But and, if you understand then, from biblical theology, it's not their works, though, uh, that they're rewarded. It's through the blood of Christ, by their faith in Christ, that they were saved. Yeah. And then after they were saved, uh, the forensic justification, well, then they did works in Christ. And uh, God will reward them on that sense. Not that they'll attain salvation for those works. But no, no but it just says in Romans 2.6, uh, he says, God who will repay everyone according to his works, eternal life to those who seek glory, honor, and immorality through perseverance in good works, but wrath and fury to those who selfishly disobey the truth and obey wickedness. So here, what we do how we respond with our free will to the grace of God and uh, whether or not our faith is completed by good works as James teaches, as Matthew 25 seems to indicate, as Paul himself clearly indicates in 1 Corinthians 13, that is crucial to our salvation. Let me tie that to what you just stated then in with, uh, you know, as I'm trying to get it back to the subject I want to bring up, Okay, as you've stated before, you can believe basically anything of any religion and can be saved, not necessarily will be saved. Yeah. But you believe end, you can be saved being in a completely, let's say you're in a religion that, uh, to no, no fault of your own, 
you were raised in some uh, voodoo witch doctor sect. And maybe you have a uh, baby sacrifice once a, a, a year down in a, the Amazon River to the crocodiles. And uh, you're doing this year after year, and then you live and die. And, now, would you consider, from the, based on the verse you just read a minute ago, that God would judge them, even though they're sincere in their religion, that this would be a vile act by killing a baby in a human sacrifice, sacrifice it to their gods and say that might be the alligators? Well, certainly uh, that type of uh, primitive, violent religion uh, would not be the ground of their salvation. So, uh, so that, but they, could, they can still be saved, though. That's not, I'm just, I'm just repeating what is taught at Vatican II, that those who through no fault to their own do not know the gospel of Jesus Christ or his church, but move by grace, strive by their deeds to do God's will as it is known to them in the dictates of conscience. And you know in the radio exchange, Romans 2.25 is crucial there. One could also appeal to John 12.47. Well, you got to read Romans 2.12 and 2.16 for context. Well, where Jesus says, I did not come to condemn the world but to save the world. Now you couple that with 1 Timothy 2.4, God desires all people to be saved and come to know the all truth. All types of people. Well, that's your interpretation, but there's... It's as good as yours, though. No, it's not, because mine has the backing of the church which Jesus established. But it in any you. case... Well, yeah, but I, I'll show your church teaches things which are contradicted now, by the Bible. Now, how does that apply to... Let me ring up a case, scripture real quick. And, and, real scripture, uh, scripture just for a moment, then you can go back. Uh, it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, it says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And as you know, in Titus 1, 9, it says there's people that profess to know God, but in works they deny him and That's are right. reprobate unto every pure work or something that, of that, that nature. That's, that's so right. there's people that... Uh, obey not the gospel. These witch doctors, the, Bo sure. the Muslims, the Buddhists, all these people do not obey the gospel. Are you saying that this scripture is not valid here? No, I'm not saying it's not valid. I'm saying you need to take all of scripture, Larry. And what we're trying to say here is this scripture indicates what is called theologically the universal salvific will of God. Now, now. That God desires all people to be saved and come to know the truth. Jesus died for all, I could provide about half a dozen scriptures that I know, indicate you've done it in the previous that, that, that he died for all. So his death on the cross and his resurrection was sufficient for the salvation of all of humanity. But that does not mean that all will be saved. You said at the conclusion of our last debate that the Catholic Church teaches universalism. We do not. We do not teach universalism that everyone's going to go to heaven. There might be some. Oh, I know that. There I'm just saying that every single religion on the face of the earth, based out of your own lips, can be saved. Well, now, apart from the blood of Christ, apart no, from... No, 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 no. Okay, you're, yeah, you're, okay, you're I, I, I retract are, that. You're are. right. Uh, you're saying that his blood somehow mystically applies to any, any religion across the world in a mystical way, like you said on the radio debate, but they can still be saved even though they know not Christ or obey not his gospel. They... Now, Christ is the incarnate Word of God, and we know from the prologue of the Gospel of John that the Logos, or the Word of God, is identified with the light which enlightens all men, or all men and women. So, in other words, the, the, you could go to the Church Fathers, like St. Justin Martyr and Clement of Alexandria and others, and they said that there was a spark of truth of course, you'd, there, also there deny, a, you'd also deny their writings, though, on justification, because no. it doesn't match up with the uh, No, it does, Catholic it does. I could show that. I, well, I, anyway, I that's another the, debate. I didn't but. have those texts before, but I have them now. But in any case, in any case, what we're saying here, and it corresponds with Romans 2.15, it corresponds with the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, when Paul goes to the Areopagites, uh, and he compliments them, and he quotes some pagan poets, that we know... That doesn't mean he approved of their religion. No, but it shows that he found at least some degree of truth. That doesn't prove that they'll be saved, just because he quotes from them. I mean, that, that doesn't follow logically. I agree, it doesn't show, but at least it, it, it indicates that there is some element of truth outside of what we would call biblical religion, and that is scriptural. Well, in Romans some... 2, 
15 that you keep mentioning. I just wanted to mention for the listening audience that it says that those people will perish in verse 12, and they have to obey in verse 16. But uh, well, let yes, me bring but, up this but, chart but it and says, have you comment It says on in this. Romans 2.15, just to counteract that, they show that the demands well, of the law are written in their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even defend them on that day when according to my gospel the gospel is god Jesus will judge christ. people's hidden works through christ now let me just right. mention this larry what you're trying to do what you're trying to do here is to play the role of god and the catholic church I, uh, is just simply leaving the door open to the mystery of god that in other words god who is the author of scripture and clearly indicates that the the way he has chosen for human beings to enter into salvation is through jesus christ who is the way the truth and the life it was very impressive to me when pope john paul ii spoke in denver in front of uh, it was it, i know and he so believes many, that and he said he said uh, his opening lines were i greet you in the name of jesus christ who is the way the truth and the life so this is the teaching of the Catholic Church. But not Jesus. necessarily. No, not there's necessarily. nothing in Catholic teaching which denies that. And I, I well, defy I'm you saying to show that they deny the gospel and still be saved through the blood of Christ, according to your definition that you gave us last Saturday night and in this TV show. I'm just trying to say a man can it, it, deny it, the gospel, deny Muslims. No, I mean, look, it, your resume says you you are in a Muslim Christian so, dialogue committee. I know you deal with them. You, you said so, it before. I, all I'm trying to get so to then is Paul this, was in 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 a, in a, in a in a Christian pagan dialogue in Acts 17. In, in Romans 1, 20, it says they're without excuse. It says they'll perish in Romans 2, He's 12. talking, about, You're this, leaving he's talking about the corrupt Romans there, those who do those terrible things, and even How Dr. Do you know Mori. Not, uh, uh, Dr. Are you saying a good Muslim is different than a corrupt Muslim, even though they have the same belief systems? Sure. And so his good works can get him saved, whereas the other bad Muslim because he has bad works, won't get him saved. That doesn't, that's not what the Catholic Church Well, then how do they teaches. get saved? I they, want to know how they get saved well, by the Well, first of all, of we don't know if they're... If you they're, don't know. Okay. We don't know if they are being saved. We're simply looking at the Scriptures. You're giving them a break. We're, we're, no. We're letting God be God. I'm not in the business of saying... You're saying God has to save them despite what we're no, reading the Scriptures. No, that does I didn't say God has to save them. He can save them. Yes, and you deny that? You deny that I God... Den I deny... When it says that a person denies the Gospel... He doesn't believe it. It says clearly that they will be damned. If the person has the gospel preached to him or her, and that person denies the gospel, that person cannot be saved. What was being dealt with in the 1949 letter of the Holy Office to Father Feeney in Boston, and what was repeated in uh, Lumen Gentium 16 of Vatican II, was the question of invincible ignorance. And so... That's uh, the out. And so That's this, the way is, to get out th this is what uh, the Holy Office wrote to Father Leonard Feeney in okay, 1949. I'm well aware of that. I'm well aware of that. And, and he said that uh, he talks about how uh, those, only those are to be accounted as members of the church in reality, reapse, who have been baptized and professed the true faith and who have not had the misfortune of withdrawing from the body or for grave faults have been cut off by the legitimate authority. And then he goes on, he's quoting uh, uh, Pope Pius XII here, and he says, he, Pope Pius XII, by no means excludes those men from eternal salvation uh, who uh, ordain to the mystical body by some kind of unconscious desire or longing. So he does not exclude them from eternal salvation, but on the other hand, he, the Pope, does point out that they are in a, in a condition in which they cannot be secure about their salvation since they lack many great gifts and helps from God which they can enjoy only in the Catholic Church. So the question was... I would say, oh, it's was, another gospel. It's another no, gospel. no, it's not another gospel. Uh, above that it says, Paul when a man is invincibly ignorant, God also accepts an implicit desire. Where does it say in the scripture? So-called because it is contained in the good disposition of the soul by which a man wants his will to be conformed 
to God. Where does it say in the scripture their invincible ignorance gets them off the hook with God? It says in Romans 1.20, they're without excuse. No, but they in, will Romans, be judged. in Romans 2.25, it admits the possibility that their conscience nope. can accuse or defend them. That's a false and interpretation, that, and you would agree that my interpretation is false. It's a Mexican standoff on this point. Yeah, I'm but simply I, have, saying I have the backing of an infallible church, and you do not. Hold it. I deny that claim, though. You well, say, I mean, the Jehovah's Witness tells me the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is the only organization, through a theocratic yeah. organization of God on earth. The Mormon church say they're the only church. We're it. Everybody else is lost. you got to believe us. Yeah, You're which, doing the same thing the cults No, do. no, because neither of them can show a continuous tradition from the time of Jesus Christ, whereas we can in any public library. You Are you saying look it's up. infallible? Well, I'm sorry? Are you saying it's infallible, this continuous tradition the, to prove your infallible church? The, and the Holy Spirit is infallible. And the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church of Can Jesus Christ. Can a church Christ. lose its candlestick? Can Jesus remove the candlestick like we find in Revelation no. 2, 5 and take it away so that church becomes Ichabod? The glory of God has departed. Can God withdraw himself from a church like we find the seven churches in, in, in Revelation? They're in Revelation chapters 1 through 3. You've got the Lodicean church, the church of Ephesus, Philadelphia church, and so forth. In fact, uh, let me read a scripture here for a second and see, what you, see how you react to this. It says, uh, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in, walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thy, thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say that they are apostles and are not and has found them liars, and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake hath labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now, verse 5 is the key one. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its, out of its place, except thou repent and you know the whole book of hebrews was written against apostasy yeah people can become apostate exactly i'm saying your church became apostate when, when? oh about 1546 when the council of trent oh. convened <laughs> oh really so then you believe in everything the catholic church taught before 1546 no no there's a lot of heretics where, in, where? in fact what does a heretic no, mean no are where, there where? any heretics there clearly were heretics there's a witness to heresy even in the new testament what is the but, definition but, but, of a heretic one literally one who makes a choice or selects something out of a body of beliefs but selects something which is not in accordance with the truth or one who uh, one a material heresy would be the denial of a truth of faith which has been proclaimed as a truth of faith okay what's the consequence of being a heretic you're cut off from the church and so consequently your church has been cut off. You belong to the apostate church, but thank God, Vatican II admits the possibility of your salvation because you now, might be an invincible Now, ignorance. let me finally get to that chart then, and let's talk about this. You're, you're saying that I can still be saved because... Because of possibly... The possibly. Possibly uh, invincible ignorance. This other ignorance. gospel of possibly and in, invincible yeah. ignorance that yeah. I'm trying to show the could distinction. I, could I just get back to one, uh, to one scripture here where in Hebrews 11, since you mentioned... 11.6? Uh, Hebrews, yes, 11.6, but without faith it is impossible to please God, for anyone who approaches God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. Now, uh, Paul in Acts 17 talks about Does how... that apply to the man in Hebrew, uh, Titus 1.9? I mean, 1.15 wait, wait, let, let me just finish. Okay, go ahead. And then, and then uh, you, you could have your say. Uh, in other words, those who are seeking God, a person could only seek God if somehow the mysterious grace of God is operating there. Just as in Acts 10, Cornelius had his prayers and almsgiving go up to God, and God was pleased by those, but he could only have done those good works if there had somehow been the grace of God. So the Spirit blows where it will. So we don't want to place limits upon how the grace of God operates. And so what it's saying here is that those who... Uh, believe in God here uh, it, um, in, in, in Hebrews 11 6 
for who, but uh, for anyone who approaches God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You know, there's a lot of people no. that seek God in a religion, yeah. but they're really running from God. They're not trying to try and find the true God. Their religion is right. an escape from and, the and, true God. And the Catholic Church warns Catholics not to misinterpret the teaching that God could possibly, through his infinite power and mercy, the God who uh, did not come into the world to condemn it, but to save it, that God could, in his own uh, uh, mysterious way, apply the grace of Jesus Christ to people who are outside the visible structure of the church. The church is warning, and it warns in Lumen Gentium 16, that this does not mean that one should stop preaching the gospel. And why? After it says those also can be saved who through no fault to their own and so forth, strive right. by grace to do God's will as it is known to them through the dictates of conscience. Well, but, but then it says, uh, it, it, it indicates that these other religions could be understood, the good ones, as a preparation for good the religions? gospel. Good religions? What religion is no, a good religion? Well, there are elements. Shh, shh. There are ele <laughs> You've been doing a majority no, 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 of the talking. No, 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 no. I've been trying to get this well, chart I'm forever. To <laughs> I'm trying to explain this. But yeah, but, you're but, taking but, up all the time doing it, too. She knows <laughs> that it was given by him who enlightens all men so that they may finally have life. But often men deceived by the evil one have become vain in their reasonings and have exchanged the truth of God for a lie, serving the cre creature rather than the creator. This is Romans 1. Or some there are who, living and dying in the world without God, are exposed to final despair. Wherefore, to promote the glory of God and procure the salvation of all of these, and mindful of the command of the Lord, preach the gospel to every creature, the church fosters the missions with care and attention. So Is it, that why Pius VI in 1965 went to Bombay, India, and... Uh, and read from the uh, uh, Hindu sacred writings Upanishad. and said that we have yeah, and we have respect for your religion. No, and no goes different around, than no different than Paul going John Paul, and quoting quoting pagan poets to the uh, Areopagus and running around saying that the, the 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 Jews, the Muslims, and Christians all worship the same God. You know, John Paul II said that they all worship the same God. No, it, and uh, I there mean, there is but one God, and the uh, and the Scripture says this is uh, not true. The Scripture says that. Unless they're worshiping the true God by the born-again experience, by being dwelt by the Holy Spirit, you cannot know God. The natural man is without the Spirit of God, neither can he know them. Can't even understand these things. That's uh, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. It also says in Romans chapter 8, I think around verse 7, that the, na the carnal mind is at an enmity with God. Yeah. And if a man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Did and I, 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 I submit to you, doctor, that, that the Hindus are none of Christ, the Muslims are none of Christ, all these false religions are none of Christ because they have not the Spirit of the Lord in them. Well, Their bodies are not the temple of the Holy would Spirit. Would you admit that they are created in the image and likeness of God? All men are created, but now they're fallen. Read Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and following. It tells you their, their, their throats are open and sepulcher. They're, no man seeks God. It, it, all those scriptures in there in Romans chapter 3. Well, then that's contradicted by Acts 17, where Paul seems to indicate that there was this unknown God, and they were groping seems for God. Seems to indicate God. you're groping for an no. interpretation that doesn't no. wash logically, no. but, no. but that, I know no. we'll disagree on that. Now, let me get to this chart now. I think I've been trying for 15 minutes now, and I want to get your comments on this. Okay, all I'm saying. I'm going to your God, fellow... God, and I'm not in the business of saying who's going to hell. All God, right. who's all powerful and all merciful, could decide that. Okay, I want to know who speaks for Rome according to these charts. Uh, you're talking about the reason your interpretation is better than mine is because you have the infallible church, and all the rest of us Protestants and other one, anyone that's not a Roman Catholic is up the creek because we have bad interpretations and we don't have the true. Well, let, let me of qualify Christ. that. Vatican II clearly stated that. The church established by Jesus Christ is to be found in its fullness in the Catholic Church. I know that's what it says. But there are elements of truth and holiness outside the visible structure. So you love Jesus, I love Jesus. You believe in grace, I believe in grace. So there's obviously but, some but things see, we believe in. see, your Jesus is different from my Jesus. Well, that's why we have a different gospel. You must be very good at mind reading then. Well, you <laughs> worship a wafer when you have transubstantiation as God. And no, I don't no. believe that little piece of bread is God or Jesus Christ. Well, I deny that. All right, you deny the word And see, that's your Jesus. No, you deny the It's a piece of bread. You're only getting it through Aristotelian uh, no, philosophy. that's not true. Accidents. 
and substance. But anyway, well, I don't want to get well, into that. I'm just trying no, to show a difference. No, that can be sh so shot down. I mean, you could appeal to Ig Ignatius of Antioch writing. I already told you the Encyclopedia Britannica says that he is unreliable. Interpolations <laughs> have been found spurious. There's uh, Anglican scholars have done research on this. That doesn't you're going mean all to, of his writings. In other words, you're you, going you'd to non-canonical take... uh, sources not only to get your interpretation on transubstantiation, yeah. but then uh, the infallibility... And you're going outside of the Bible to say there's 27 books of the New Testament and four Gospels within those 27 books. How am where I going outside of it? They're right here. They're right here. <laughs> yes, but Scripture's where in Scripture right does it say there should only be four? And who, put, who put Scripture together? The Catholic Church. Uh, All right, go on uh, to your chart. Well, okay, go finally on the to chart. Your okay, let's go to the chart. I want to run through these briefly, and then I want to have your comments, Doctor. Okay, this is the infallible church that uh, Dr. Prestige is a member of. It says here, with faith urging us, we are forced to believe and to hold the one holy Catholic Church, and that apostolic, and we firmly believe and simply confess this church outside which there is no salvation or remission of sins. That's, of course, Boniface VIII in his bull Unum Sanctum, November 18, 1302. And, of course, then we have the Athanasian Creed. The first sentence says, Whosoever wishes to be saved needs, above all, to hold to the Catholic faith unless each one preserves this whole and inviolate. He will, without a doubt, perish in eternity. Now, continuing with this... Uh, well, there's Lumen Gentian. I want to save that one for a minute. Uh, let's go to the Council of Florence, which is, uh, I would uh, suppose you would recognize that as an authoritative council. Yes. In uh, 1438 and 1445, it says, It firmly believes, professes, and proclaims that those not living within the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but Jews also, and heretics, of which I am one, and schismatics, I guess, which were the reformers were called, and, and all those guys, and that's Protestants basically, cannot become participants of eternal life, but will depart into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Authoritative Roman Catholic Council saying the pagans will go to hell, the Jews will go to hell, the heretics will go to hell, and the schismatics will go to hell. And then down here, I'm going to save that one too. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I might as well go to it now, I guess. I'm sorry. Let me go to Nostra Aetate, then in Second uh, Vatican Council. I've got a lot more quotes where all the popes were saying there's no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, all these years, uh, papal decrees, so forth, there's no salvation unless you're of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. And then what we have here is, uh, is uh, this statement. In fact... Uh, I'll read it from uh, the Nostra Aetate, Second Vatican Council. It says, It is true that the church is the new people of God, yet the Jews should not be spoken of as rejected or accursed as if this followed from Holy Scripture. So now up above here on the chart, we have the Council of Florence saying that the Jews are going to hell. And then down below in Vatican II, it's saying that the Jews should not be spoken of as rejected or accursed as if this followed from Holy Scripture. We have a point-blank contradiction. As you can see on your screen at home, we've got the Jews mentioned here, and then down below, suddenly it's a complete reversal. I can quote you from uh, uh, the, your own man here uh, uh, about uh, uh, Karl Rahner. He said, he said that uh, signs of a change in Rome's stance toward critical biblical studies appeared in 1941. Uh, when the Biblical Commission condemned an overly conservative distrust of modern biblical research. And it just goes on here, talking about Raymond Brown and these other guys, how from the mid-1950s, uh, this modernistic uh, movement started spreading throughout the seminaries of the Roman right, Catholic are Church. Are you finished? Are you uh, finished? Or okay, could let, you... Me, let me finish, uh, finish in just a couple of last things. I mentioned Florence. I mentioned these other things. I'm, I, I want to show also that uh, in, uh, in here, uh, the Vatican II has high esteem for the Muslims. It, it talks about the Mormons believing the Trinity. Now, that's a Catholic encyclopedia, not Vatican II. But uh, let me read the one scripture then that's key to all this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and through 18. Uh, let me see here. Here we go. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? 
For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And you know that Monsignor Ed Jordan, in that debate that he had with Rob Zins, he said that you could worship idols, you could be a sincere believer in conscience. I've even got the Catholic spirit here. Conscience calls us to the ultimate authority. Your conscience is your guide. That's what gets you saved or not. Uh, and this is totally foreign to the Word of God. This is another gospel. And uh, go ahead and say your speech. I could keep going here, well, but I want to give you some time. Well, it's, it's, it's not another gospel because the gospel uh, I follow says that God is love. And those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them, in the first letter of John. That's the gospel I know of. In any case, uh, you stated that there's a direct contradiction yeah, let between, me put that chart back up. Be, between uh, Florence and between, uh, between Florence and Unum Sanctum and Nostra Tate. Well, indeed, this is what the Lefebvre writes, who are a schismatic Catholic church. Uh, a, a schism from the outside uh, within the Catholic Church they broke away are saying that there is a contradiction but there is not a contradiction because uh, the Council of Trent clearly indicated the necessity of baptism for salvation but also mentioned the desire for baptism so this is what was called baptism by desire so this has a long long standing tradition now the question that was not dealt with in Unum Sanctum or the Council of Florence was what about those people who are outside of the church through no fault of their own? Now if they're outside of the church because they've rejected the church and uh, uh, Boniface VIII writing in the Middle Ages and so on was saw the Jews as people who had consciously rejected the gospel and you could go back to John Chrysostom and others to have that point of view. Uh, but what was not dealt with, well, what about people who are outside of the visible structure of the church through no fault of their own? Now, I did my doctoral dissertation on a French theologian named Yves de Paris writing in the 17th century, and he said that all the doctors of the church teach that those who are ignorant of the gospel or the church uh, if they follow the natural law, which is God's law, according to conscience, and he's appealing here to Romans 2.15, they could be saved. And he never was condemned for this. So there had been a history of discussion. Gregory the, issue, the, the, the issue that had to be settled then was not the principle. The principle is retained by Vatican II that the church is made necessary for salvation. Only those who have some kind of desire, in other words, if they knew that God Almighty had established the church as the means of salvation. If they knew this, they would join it, uh, and then they, they decide not to join it. They cannot be saved. And this is I directly... Di please let me finish. You went on for a long time. Well, uh, Dr. Vestigian, we're running out of time. That's why I'm trying to All right, statements. all right. You want to have this as part of your closing well, statement? Or, okay. Or I could, uh, I could even ask you both a question right now. The, su the subject seemed to be mainly universalism the whole yeah. time. And um, so I would just ask both of you this question. You can answer tonight in your closing statements. I'll give you an extra minute or something, three minutes a piece to close out. Um, you know, whether the, the church used to say that you had to be a Catholic or you have to do sacraments, or now if you're ignorant of it, you can somehow be saved. My question to you and to Larry would be why should you be a Roman Catholic? Yeah. And I would say, why should you, uh, you know, not be a Roman Catholic, or why should you be an evangelical Christian? I would just say the scripture makes it clear. Your, your faith should be in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't take some roll of the dice here with this Roman Catholic flip-flop that we've seen from the Council of Florence and then the, the uh, Nostra Aetate in Vatican II, 
where one that says the Jews are damned and the other one that says, well, we shouldn't reject them. And then this mystical way by extension of the church and all this rigmarole, I just go with the scripture which tells us we should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you follow the words of holy written scripture. I've got, we didn't have time here. I've got charts that uh, we could go through that show the uh, ins inspiration of scripture here uh, and why it's a reliable God. Not church councils, they change. They change with time. In fact, in the debate with Monsignor Jordan of St. Teresa's Catholic Church, he said, oh, we've gone past Trent. That doesn't apply anymore. You know, and you've seen that debate, Dr. Moore. Oh, on time, so I want to be able to let you say some words here, too. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, go ahead. You, uh, you well, can just uh, have three minutes to... Jesus uh, founded one church. He didn't find, uh, establish 28,000, as there are today, different Protestant sects. And he prayed in the uh, great prayer of John 17, Father, I pray that they may be one as you and I are one. He established one church. He established it upon Peter the Rock and upon the apostles. It says in 1 Timothy 3, 5, that the church is the pillar and foundation of truth, and it does not say that scripture alone is the authority. Larry never established that. He never gave any scriptural evidence. And talking about contradiction, I see Protestants contradicting each other all over. In the very beginning of the Protestant Reformation, they couldn't agree on essentials. And then what happened, you, you finally have Socinus denying the Trinity. See? And so this is what happens when you have scripture alone. Why belong to the Catholic Church? Because the Catholic Church retains all that Jesus taught. We're not throwing out the Eucharist. We're not throwing out baptism. Uh, we're, we're not throwing out the succession of the apostles. We're retaining all of these scriptural elements, the importance of intercessory prayer, the great importance of Mary, who says, do whatever he tells you. We are retaining the New Testament, and Larry is cutting apart the New Testament and saying, well, no, no, that doesn't mean that, does, that doesn't mean that, and he's selective. So he says we're justified by faith alone when Scripture itself contradicts that, and Scripture itself indicates, even in Paul, that if I have faith great enough to move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. That faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. So he just ignores those scriptures that don't suit him, and this is what happened with Protestantism from the very beginning. There were divisions, there was disagreement. This is not the sign of the Holy Spirit. This is not the church established by Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vestigi. Closing statements, Larry. All right, I'd just like the people to be aware here in this debate. Uh, I think you've seen a good representation from both sides on this issue that we simply don't agree on almost anything which uh, should hopefully uh, let people know there's not much of an ecumenical spirit here when it comes to uh, those that really hold to the scripture instead of these uh, Roman Catholic traditions as Dr. Prestige is uh, well versed in, in quoting to us. I'd like to go to the scripture here. It says in uh, 1 John chapter 2 verse 22 it says, Who is the liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? The Buddhists deny this, the Muslims deny this, the Hindus deny this, all these weird religions out there deny this. And Dr. Prestige says, well, they can still, perhaps, in some ethereal way, be saved. I deny that. What it says here is I follow the scripture. It says, he, the, he who, uh, who is the liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the, is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. And when we go on in the scripture here, and, and this is the record that God had given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Not in Islam or following the doctrine of super irrigation or hoping some other saint did more good work so they can spigot it over to you through that, 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 that bar spigot to help you get extra grace or good works. It's through faith alone in Jesus. And it says right here, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. What does it say in John 3, 36? He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son hath not, uh, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Uh, what we're talking about here are two different Gospels. I mentioned before, what the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, verse 31 said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they, they said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. They didn't say, uh, follow the ecumenical councils of the church and the Council of Florence and 
the uh, Vatican II and, and the decrees of the Pope and so forth, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay. All right. Well, um, I hope that, uh, well, thank you, first of all, for being with us, Dr. Fastigi and Larry Wessels. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed the uh, discussion. I hope you would uh, turn to the scriptures, uh, read the Bible, seek the truth. Uh, basically, we want you to uh, just seek God with all your mind, heart, and soul and ask Him to show you the truth, and I believe He will. And I would ask that you search the scriptures and take into account uh, the information that was given uh, in the debates. And thank you for joining us. Till next time, God bless. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 